Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. Wow. What is what a time. Amen. I tell you what, I'm pumped today. I am pumped. I don't know about you. Hey, it's time for our kindergarten first and second graders to go ahead. Miss Carrie's in the back, so you can be dismissed to Children's Church. And uh, y'all go ahead and head on out. Kindergarten first and second grade. Uh, we'll see y'all here in just a little bit. But man, I tell you, having the praise and worship like we just had, uh, then allowing me to have the privilege of baptizing someone, and now this, wow, I'm glad I'm here today, amen? I hope you're glad you're here today as well. God bless you and thank you. For all those that are home watching or wherever you are watching on this live stream, thank you for joining us as well. Today I'm going to begin a, a, a series of messages, just a few messages on uh, a very important time, very important topic and time for our church as we are going to be encouraging you from this point over the next several weeks to begin to pray about the idea of calling some men in our church to follow, uh, to be ordained as deacons. And so what I want to do is I want to share some messages with you about the idea of deacon. So deacon servants is what we're going to be titling our message today. And we're going to be looking in the book of Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. So once you go ahead and uh, take your Bibles and turn there, you at home, please join us as well as we get ready to read the scripture. We're going to be looking today at the idea of a servant, what it is to be a servant, not just as a deacon, but as a pastor, as a church member, as a Christian. What does it mean to be servant? Because that's a very, very important idea, a very, very important mentality that we are to be having in the church. So Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. Let's go ahead and stand in honor of reading God's word this morning. And the Bible tells us, starting at verse 25, But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and then to give his life a ransom for many. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the blessings you've given us. And, and God, as we come to this time of our service, I pray as always that this time would be a continuation of the great worship that we've experienced, Lord, as we now step into receiving your word. God, I pray that the words I'm about to say are not my words. I pray, God, with all my heart that these are your words. I pray that this is not a message I put together, but Lord, it's a message that you laid on my heart to give to, to your people. And Father, I pray that it would be resp their response would be as you desire for it to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. What brought Jesus to respond to this? Well, just prior to this, as if we were to look back up and starting in verse 20, there was a lady who was the mother of two of the apostles. And what she had done was she had gone to Jesus and said, Hey, Jesus, I have two absolutely amazing boys that are following you. And I'm their mama, and they are the best thing since sliced bread. Amen? Now, mamas, aren't all your kids like that? Amen? They're the best, and everybody ought to know your kids. Every kid ought to be like your kid. Amen? And so this is kind of how they, she felt. And she was saying, look, I know those other guys. I know they're, they're pretty good. They're not, they're not bad. But man, my boys, my boys, you need to put them at the head. One needs to be on your right. One needs to be on your left because they are that good. You, you hit it on the head when you called those boys to follow you. And so they, they were coming in, and these mama boys were, were being lifted up by mama mama was trying to get him into a heavy heavy spot and and jesus of course looked at her and and this was his response he well first of all he didn't actually respond to her he responded to the apostles because they were all they were all getting kind of ruffled feathers as well the other 10 were going well my mama wasn't here mama had been here she had been able to say that's not fair that his mama gets to talk to jesus like that so they were all getting mad and jesus said oh i i i i i we're not about to have a, uh, we're not going to have to call a committee meeting to get this church back in order. I'm about to set you in order right now. Amen. And that's why Jesus is trying to tell them, look, this is not going to be a problem and it shouldn't be a problem amongst you. 
this shouldn't be a topic that we have to even discuss. Because this idea of wanting to be up, but wanting to be elevated, is not where I want you to be. He said, as a matter of fact, I want to show you as an example what you're supposed to be. So when we talk about deacon servants, we're, we're talking about men who are not going to be elevated to any position. They're going to be called to be servants, just though the same way that I believe that God would have the church, each one of us, as members of the church, or wherever you're a member of, that you would be a servant and have the mindset of a servant. Now, before we go any further, I want to go ahead and mention to you the idea of what it is uh, to be a deacon. Here is the idea of the deacon, a man who is called to serve or to minister in the church body. To be called into that position or an, of an ordained person. Now, here at First Baptist West, our idea of the idea for the ministry of deacon is this: to assist the pastor in any capacity of ministry. All right, to to assist the pastor, to to be a servant and help me, to not be ruled by me, and I'm not above them, and they're not above me, and and we always joke. And I, I said before, even when I came here. Uh, almost 10 years ago that one of the things was that I would never have to walk into a deacon's meeting and ask the deacons for permission to do anything because I never felt like they had that authority. So all I want to do is my deacons are, are my, my, my prayer partners. They're the ones that I talk to. They talk to me and we, we work through the church stuff. But to also to ensure scriptural integrity. That is the one part that we at First Baptist West view our deacons. They are to make sure that Scripture is being done, taught right and taught well here at our church, but also to minister to the families of the church. It is quite impossible for me to be in contact with every member every week of First Baptist West. It just can't happen. But as deacons, we separate our families uh, into ministry groups, and each deacon has that many. So this is the idea. I, 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 I'm just saying this now just to take a, a piece of my message to get you to understand what do we, how do we view here in First Baptist West what a deacon does. Now... I shared in the first service that in most churches, now I gave you two things, to help in the, to serve the, to, oh, here I said it again. I said in the first service, they're to serve the pastor. They're not to serve the pastor. I, we just declared that. They're not my servants. Oh, I wish. No, I'm kidding. They're not my servants. They're my partners, and we, we partner together. But also to ensure the integrity of, of the scripture. That's two things. A lot, in a lot of churches, the pastor would love to add a third thing if he's really going to describe what a deacon was in his church uh, because in most churches the pastor he wouldn't admit it out loud but he hasn't others have admitted it is the third one is to drive the pastor crazy and be on his back all the time amen that's kind of what uh, you say well does that really happen well apparently so it hadn't happened to me but I believe I've heard many pastors who feel that's what happens in most deacons I praise the Lord That here at First Baptist West, I have an amazing, listen to me, I have an absolutely amazing relationship with my deacon body and their yoke fellows. I I love those guys and we, I I look forward, believe it or not, I look forward to the deacons meetings so that I can visit with them, pray with them, talk to them about the things that are going on in the church because I I trust them. So that's not the third requirement of a deacon at First Baptist West, but in most churches, unfortunately, it is. But I have a great relationship with the deacons. And so when we're talking about servants, this is the mentality that that we're looking for. When you pray about someone who's going to serve as a deacon, these are the qualifications that that we're going to be looking at. And I'm going to talk about more uh, later on. But I want to get back to the idea of serving because this is whether you're the minister of the servant, uh, a a mindset of the servant has got to be different than the mindset of the world. Whether or not you're uh, a deacon, whether you're uh, a member of First Baptist West or a Christian, listening to this message today, there's a certain mindset that Jesus is wanting us to have as Christians. And it's not the same mindset as the world. It's not to think like the world. But here's the couple things that that I came up with that I see in this text that Jesus was trying to get us to understand. The first mindset of a servant is the fact that it's to uh, to to give, not receive. To give, not receive. Now, there's a whole lot of people who might disagree with you on that, that it's better to receive than to give. But here, the mindset of a servant is it's not about me. It's not about what people can do for me. It's what I can do for people. The Bible tells us in Acts 20, 35. Guys, this isn't working.
something's wrong. But Acts 20, 35 tells us that it's more blessed to give than receive. More blessed to give than receive. But a lot of times in the world, we have this idea of it's about me. What do I get? What, do, what, gain, what, do, what, what comes about because of what I'm about to do? And if I'm going to do this, what's in, what do I get? How are you going to reward me? Well, Jesus here is giving us the idea that it's better to give ourselves over. In other words, it's to surrender. Now, this idea of surrender is a negative thing in the world. The world thinks the idea of surrender is being into forced labor, to be overpowered, to be, to be basically you to looking at somebody and you tapping out saying, that's it, I give up, you've overpowered me, I have no choice, I'm giving it to you. But here we're looking and we're seeing that the mindset of a servant, when we're talking about spiritual surrender, it's actually yielding ourselves over and doing it because that's what God has called us to do. And quite frankly, then we look at it and we see that it's not forced. It's not forced. That it's not something that someone causes me to do. It's not something that, that somebody is forcing me to do. That I'm tapping out. I'm surrendering myself over. As a matter of fact, it's voluntary surrender. Can I tell you something that Jesus said? That the Son of Man has come to serve and not be served. So he's saying that as an example here, I want you to understand. I'm going to show you what it's like. And so it's voluntary surrender. Can I tell you this? That Jesus voluntarily surrendered himself to be a servant. And then we, all we have to do is go look at the cross and we see that Jesus was not forced to be on the cross. People could, do not, people could not do anything or take anything that Jesus didn't give them. Amen? So when we're talking about, he said, I have come to serve. In other words, no one is making me do this because we've got to have the idea of John 19.10. If you'll remember, here's a great story about that. In John 19.10, Jesus if you'll know, was arrested and brought before uh, Pilate and he's standing there and Pilate's trying to get him to to talk to him and and respond to him and Jesus isn't saying anything. And and Pilate finally looks at him and, and, and I think Pilate has this idea that they had captured Jesus. He had no choice to be there. And this is what he said to them. Are you not speaking to me? In other words, you're not talking? I'm asking you a question. Then he poses this. He says, do you not know that I have the power to crucify you, but I also have the power to release you. Do you not know who you're talking to? I'm the guy. I'm the guy you better be responding to because you don't have a choice, but I have a choice over you. Now, Jesus had been quiet this whole time, and that's why Pilate was angry. Pilate said, do you not know who you're talking to? Don't you understand that I have the power to release you? Don't you know that by a word I can say crucify him and man, you're going to be crucified? This is when Jesus spoke up. And listen to what Jesus said. In the next verse that we have, Jesus said, answered and said, you would have no power against me if it's not given from the Father. In other words, you don't have a choice. You couldn't do this if I didn't voluntarily let you. I wouldn't even be standing here if, you didn't, if I didn't choose to be here. As a matter of fact, there's another part of that story that prior to this, if you'll remember, that Jesus was with his apostles and, and they came to arrest him and they asked him the question, said, Are you him? And you remember what Jesus said? Jesus looked at him and said, I am. And you remember what happened, though, when he said, I am? Every one of those who had come to arrest Jesus, because we're armed, we're dangerous, we're big, and we're strong, and he's not going to have a choice. Man, he's going to go with us whether he wants to or not. The Bible says that when Jesus said the words, I am he, I am being God, the Bible says that those men, every one of them fell flat face down. So tell me this. If those who came to arrest Jesus, even by him speaking a word to them, could not arrest him, he said, get up, it's time for me to go, I'm going with you voluntarily, but I want you to see that you don't have anything. Listen, my friends, this is the way Jesus wants us to volunteer, this is the way he wants us to surrender over to him. He wants us to do it that we're not forced to do it. It's voluntary surrender where I say, God, here I am. I love you and I I surrender myself. I don't want to commit myself to you. I don't want to commit my life to you. God, I want to surrender it over to you. I voluntarily do it for you because we see Jesus even hanging on the cross. Even hanging on the cross, my friends. He was there and he voluntarily stayed on that cross. And he said, here I am. 
I give it to you freely. So the mindset of a servant is to give but not receive. It's not about us. But not only is that to give and not receive, but it's, it's done cheerfully. It's done cheerfully. And so as we look at this and we see that it's, it's not that, that I'm not happy about it, but I love the fact of doing it. Guys, you've got to follow up here because it's, it's not clicking. There we go. So the Bible tells us now over in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, So let each one give as he proposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, that, that it's not going to be something that I have to be doing. Man, I have to go to church today. I have to stand up here and preach a sermon today. I have to. No, it's that I get to do it. I get to serve God. It's not something that that somebody is making me do. It's because I want to do it. Listen to me. If we are a cheerful giver, you will have a good attitude towards serving and it will not count it as an, and you'll count it as an opportunity, but not an obligation. God doesn't want, listen, can I tell you, my friends, you here and you at home, God does not want any of us to feel obligated to do anything. That's not why he did that. He wants us to cheerfully surrender ourselves over him, knowing what he did for me. Knowing all that he's given me, I surrender myself to him, and I count every opportunity that I have to serve him, that I I count it as an opportunity, not out of obligation. Not out of obligation at all. But then we look and we see, but not only is it, Better to give than receive, also done cheerfully, but also not to be taken back. We don't do it and then begin to take it back and say, well, I did it for a while, but man, things are getting tough. So when things get a little tough, we want to back away. You know, I said many, many times that here in the Baptist church that it's real easy to start ministries. Man, we start them all the time, amen? But what's difficult is continuing them. Because we want to take it back because we, we surrender or so we think we surrender, and I commit to something, it gets a little tough, and then I want to take it back. I say, okay, well, wait, I want, I want to go back. I want to do something different. My friends, can I tell you, Jesus didn't just go halfway through and then change his mind. I told you just a second ago, we all know that Jesus didn't only get arrested and, and that he, they, he voluntarily come before Pilate, but if he voluntarily came before Pilate and Pilate and them couldn't do anything against him, do you know, listen, can I tell you this, he didn't have to go on the cross if he didn't want to. He cheerfully went to the cross, and he stayed on the cross. Listen, can I tell you, about halfway through it, when I know that things were going to get hard for Jesus, can I tell you this, that Jesus was not so concerned about about the beatings. Jesus wasn't so concerned about the humiliation. Jesus wasn't so concerned about all that. The thing that Jesus prayed about when he was in the garden, and he said, God, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. It wasn't that that he was concerned about. What he was concerned about was you got to know Jesus was perfect. Jesus was God. He did not have any idea any sin in him any recollection of sin nothing about sin and all of a sudden all of this sin of you and my me and everyone else was going to be piled upon jesus and he who knew no sin was about to become sin on our part and he was going to become my sin he was going to become your sin that's the cup that he prayed god if it be possible don't let this pass let this please pass from me because i'm going to be here and i'm going to have all about all the way through this and and i don't care about the humiliation i don't care about the beating i care about that you and i are not going to be in fellowship and that's why he cried out my god my god why have you forsaken me This is why, and my friends, listen to me, it's at that point, oh, can I tell you that we know that Jesus was doing it cheerfully. We know that Jesus wasn't going to go halfway and then stop because it was at that moment that I believed that the cup of sin was going to be poured upon him and he was going to become my sin. He was going to become, and I was going to become his righteousness that he could have said, no, I don't want to, this part I can't do. This part is an obligation. I don't want to do it anymore. Can I tell you this, my friend, that Jesus could have called angels from heaven and they would have come and taken him off of the cross but he didn't even need them he could have come off the cross himself because he hung on the cross not because they nailed him he hung on the cross not because they made him do it he hung on the cross because he loved me he hung on the cross because he loved you and he surrendered himself over to us that he became my sin that I could become his righteousness and he hung on the cross he didn't listen to me he didn't get halfway through and stop and praise God he didn't Because it wasn't the the shame and the humiliation. It was the separation from God. 
And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My friend, listen to me. God loves a cheerful giver because he wants someone that's going to say, God, I surrender to you. I give you everything and I'm not taking any of it back. I'm not going to get halfway through and then stop. I'm going to keep it going, Lord. I'm going to keep it going. So the second thing of the mindset of a servant is to manage and to not own. To manage and not own. Can I tell you something, my friends? All that we have is not ours all that you and i have it's not ours none of this is mine we are here if you will to manage an estate it's not ours guys you've got to follow me here i I can't it's not working so help me out but it's not working and so we look and we see the idea of a steward the steward is a person charged with supervising or taking care of something we are we are over over the man we are the managers and that's all we are again we are here to manage the estate but as stewards we are here to take care of it and it's not ours and we're here to oversee it and we're here to respect it so everything that is mine that i claim as mine is not mine it's his everything that you have everything that you claim is yours is not yours but you're here to oversee it And you're here to respect it. Overseeing it means that I'm doing it the way he wants it to be done. Overseeing it means that it's not about what I want or how I want it to do. But I'm going to take good care of it. And I'm going to respect it not because uh, because I have to, but because it's not mine, it's his. Now, I've talked to many people who own businesses. And one of the things that they always tell me is how difficult it is to get somebody to come work for them and take care of their equipment. Because they're managing the owner's equipment. And the one thing that I keep hearing is, man, they seem like they don't care. They tear it up. No big deal. But that's not the way God wants us to be. God wants us to oversee what he's given us. And he wants us to, to, if you will, respect it and take good care of it. So everything that's mine is really his. And I'm going to watch over it. The things that he's given me. My wife, she's not mine. She's his. My kids, they're not mine. They're his. This church, it's not mine, it's his. This, this pastoring, it's not mine, it's his. Nothing is mine. So I'm going to oversee it, and I'm going to respect it. And then the second thing is, we're going to use it as he leads. We're going to use it as he leads. Where what we have is for others. I'm going to use it not because of myself. I'm not going to think that, oh, I deserve all of this. It's going to be his, and I'm going to use it for others. Because I don't have to decide. I don't have to worry about it. Because it's not mine. Can I tell you that there is a reason that God blesses his people? Now, I hear a lot of times that people say, well, because if you have faith, God's going to bless you. He's going to give you so you can have money. You can do this. Can I tell you that's not, that's a distorted gospel. The reason that God blesses his people is that we can then in turn take those things that he gave us and do what with them? Help others with them. That's why we have what we have. For, for Not for us, not because I've been a good preacher and so he's going to bless me with health, wealth, and prosperity. No. If I have anything, if you have anything, if any of you at home have anything, it's going to be because he wants you to use it to bring glory and honor to him and to bring others to him. So we are stewards of this. And so if we begin to find ways that I want to use it, that I think is best, then I have now become an owner and I don't have the mindset of a servant. So we're to use it as he leads and give it to use of others. And the last one, the very important one, number three, is to find our identity in Christ. And what I mean by that is the first point is this, is that when we find our identity in Christ, worldly status will not be important. Worldly status will not be important. I'm not going to care my position. As a, hum, as a servant of God, I don't care what position he has me in as long as he has me. Amen? And I don't care what, because what you think of me doesn't matter. He even asked many times, why do you care what the world thinks? The world's going to hate you anyway. So that status... Is not what I'm after. Because I find my identity in Jesus. You know, there's a lot of people that get excited if someone famous would, uh, they meet someone famous and boy, we get all excited. Woo, I met oh so and so and they're famous. Everybody knows them. And, and man, it'd be cool if the next time I met them, they would know my name. 
But you know what? That person's not going to know your name. You care a whole lot more for them than they care for you. But here's the thing I want to say is we get excited about somebody famous knowing our name, but can I tell you that my identity is in Jesus? And can I tell you above everything else, Jesus, the one who died on the cross for me, the one who freely gave his life for me, the one who basically gives me all eternity, he knows my name. And he knows your name. And that, my friend, is what it's all about, is that he knows me. He knows me. And so my identity is not found in him then also we won't feel the need to compete with other servants. We won't feel the need to compete. As a matter of fact, when we compete and when we begin to have our eyes focused on the other servants, things get a little bit frustrating. Amen? We can grow frustrated really quickly. Case in point, we know that in the Bible there's two sisters, Mary and Martha, and we see that Mary and Martha were close to Jesus, and one time in the Scripture, Mary and Martha had Jesus come to their house, and there were a lot of people there. And we see that Mary and Martha were there to serve, and they were the servants. But the thing happened was that Mary decided, man, you know what? This is a great opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus. And Mary went to sit with Jesus. Now, Martha was a servant, and she began to watch what was going on. As a matter of fact, she quit looking at Jesus, and she quit looking at all the people she was serving, and who did she begin to look at? She began to look at Mary. And I can imagine what it was like in that house that when Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, Martha, who was the servant, who was working for Jesus, and Mary, who was not doing anything but just sitting there, I can imagine, here's what the scene must have looked like. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha is running around like a chicken with her head cut off, got all this stuff on her play, tray, and she's walking by. And what she's doing is she's looking over, and instead of looking at Jesus, she's looking at Mary. Mary. How dare her? Look at me. <sighs> and you know that, and, and guys, I, 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 I told them in the first service, I have a hard time saying about this because my wife is named Martha so I've never (laughs) so I see that Martha and most of you guys know what this is like when when the woman of the house is not happy walking through staring and when it came time to put the platter down on the table boom And she began to be so frustrated that she missed, listen to me, church, listen to me. She missed having Jesus right there. And she finally said, I'm sick of this. I'm doing all the work. She who's supposed to be serving too is just sitting there. Make her do what you're making me do. Can I tell you, she lost the mindset of a true servant. She began to look at other servants and became questionable of what they were supposed to be doing. And you remember what Jesus told her? He said, Martha, Martha, you have been so wrapped up in serving that you missed the best part. Mary understands. Listen, church, we we can't be looking around at other churches and going, why not them? What about them? Let's be like them. We can't be in the church. We can't be looking at other members of the church and say, well, what about them? Why not me? Or what about me? Why not them? If we're going to have the mindset of a servant who humbly comes before God who loved us so much that he showed us an example to be like him. That's what he wants from us. And how do we do that? As I wrap this up, how how do we do that? We come to an understanding of who he is, what he's done for us, how he drank from the cup, That we would be able to be saved. That I would then say, Lord, I I surrender all. 
All to thee do I surrender. I surrender all. God, because of what you've done for me, I want to, I want to surrender things to you. God, I, I, don't, I don't want to be forced to do it. I, I, I want to do it because I love you and I understand. I understand the suffering you gave on the cross. If you're here today or you're watching this and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, my friends, today you need to call upon his name to be saved. He died on the cross for you. That you might then be saved. He did it voluntarily. He did it with joy. And he didn't stop halfway through. And he did it for you. He did it for me. So would you come to Jesus today? Receive that precious gift. Maybe you're here, maybe you're at home, you say, well, I know I'm saved, but man, I've been... I've been watching others so much and I've been, I, 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 I've lost that servant mentality. It's all about what I'm getting and what, how I don't get it and I'm frustrated, I'm, I'm tired, I see everybody else and you know it doesn't have to be that way today. If you'll just surrender back to him, say God, restore back to me the joy of your salvation. That I've, I've, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and for looking over at other things and maybe loving the world and taking hold of those things. But Lord, today I surrender myself back to you. Forgive me, Lord. Bring back that joy. I want to have the mindset that Jesus had as a servant. I want to ask the praise team to come back up as we're going to, to close out here. But as, we're, as they're coming and they're getting ready to sing and they're going to lead you in some more singing, then I, I want you to think about this. Do you know Jesus as your Savior today? Do you know him today? And if you don't know Jesus or you're here, or maybe you're at home and you, you say, well, I, I don't know that I've ever been saved, then I, I want you to call upon his name right now. Man, you need him so desperately. Would you call on his name and be saved? Right here, you just call on his name. And I want to pray with you. I want to help you if I, if I can. But you just need Jesus. You don't need me. You need Jesus. Maybe you're here, or maybe again you're home, and you say, well, Pastor, I need, that, I need that renewal. I want to have that mindset. Maybe you just call on him, ask him today to renew that in you by seeking forgiveness of turning away from him and grabbing hold of things of this world and the cares of this world. Just say, God, I need you. And let's be renewed. Man, let's be servants. We've come here to not be served, but to serve. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, and I pray, God, for every person in this room, every person listening to this program, that, Father, if they need you, that you would call them today and they'd turn their life to you and bring, that you could bring salvation to them. But, Father, also that we as a church and others as Christians, Lord, could say that we surrender everything to you, Lord. We give it to you today. And that, Father, we could be renewed and we could have that mindset. It's no longer about us, but it's about you and it's about others. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and sing?